It's time now for Morning Rounds. Joining us are CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up this week, an update on a hopeful story we reported on last year. Researchers had good reason to believe they had found a way to beat the AIDS virus in newborns. John? This was very promising news in the battle against AIDS. Doctors in Mississippi said they may have rid a baby girl of HIV, the virus that causes the disease. But there was a major development in her case. Physicians at the University of Mississippi Medical Center had been monitoring the four-year-old girl since her unusually aggressive treatment during infancy. There had been no trace of active virus for more than two years, but a routine checkup this month showed the virus had returned. Dr. Anthony Fauci oversees AIDS research at the National Institutes of Health. It was obviously very disappointing because they were hoping that this would be the first example of a real cure of a baby related to the fact that the baby was treated aggressively very, very early, essentially from the time of birth. The case was especially promising because doctors thought the early regimen might have stopped the virus from finding hiding places in the body. At birth, the girl tested positive for HIV and was immediately treated with a three-drug cocktail. At 29 days, she was HIV negative. But after 18 months, the mother stopped treatment and disappeared for five months. When the child returned to the hospital, doctors were surprised to find no sign of the virus. Normally, it must be suppressed by the indefinite use of medication. Oh, John, this one was really heartbreaking. How's she doing now? She's actually doing quite well. She's back on medication. Her viral load is down. The level of the virus in her blood is down. The white cell count is back up, so it looks like she's doing much better. John, going forward, what do we learn from these test results? Well, the reason why this was so exciting, you heard about these hiding places, is that the thought was that maybe we could interrupt the HIV virus hanging out in these reservoirs, these hiding places where they couldn't be affected by the medication. So what happens is when you get an HIV infection, it goes through the blood, but then it also goes out to lymph tissue throughout the body. And it is able to incorporate itself back into the DNA of the cell. That's why it's called a retrovirus. It goes back into the DNA and it kind of makes a copy of itself that hangs out there. And even if you get rid of the virus in the bloodstream, it can then come out of these reservoirs later. So the thought that early aggressive treatment right. around the time of birth could knock out these reservoirs is very exciting. I think it does show though, even if it's not a cure, it was able to delay mm -hmm. the HIV virus from coming back out. So maybe this is going to give us a clue of things that we can do in the future. Some benefit, hopefully. Also this week, scientists may be a step closer in the race to develop a simple blood test for Alzheimer's. In a new study, researchers report 87% accuracy in predicting who will get the incurable disease within a year. More than 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's. It's the sixth leading cause of death. Holly, 87% accuracy. How significant are these results? Yeah, Anthony, that's very, very significant. So, you know, basically researchers, out of thousands of proteins in, in the blood, they were able to narrow it down to 10. If you have those proteins along with mild memory or thinking problems with that 87% accuracy that you mentioned, they can predict whether or not you, can, you will develop Alzheimer's within a year. So it's a very, very promising study, especially when you consider we don't have great blood tests for Alzheimer's right now. Mm -hmm. We really rely on imaging studies. Uh, there are tests that we can do with lumbar punctures and spinal fluid, uh, but mostly the diagnosis is made clinically, just based on symptoms. So having a strong blood test would be a really important tool. I have to say that when I heard about this study, the first thing I asked myself is what I want to know now that I know that there's no treatment. Do people want to know? Right. Well, you know what, Vanita, there's no cure, but there are treatments. And what we know about the treatments that makes this blood test so important is that they work best at the very, very start of the illness or arguably even before the illness starts at all. So if we know who's, who's going to get Alzheimer's disease, we can treat them early and maybe even more effectively. The other thing is that Alzheimer's doesn't just affect the patient. It's really an illness that involves the entire family. So families can plan and know what they're going to expect and you know, can make dealing with the condition much easier. And finding out who's at risk earlier, maybe you can get these people into clinical trials. That's a big hope. And That's then true. maybe find out what works and what doesn't work. We are also learning more about what it takes to kick the smoking habit. New research shows that by combining Zyban and Chantex with a nicotine patch, smokers had a 49% higher quit rate than those who only used one method. Scientists believe while both drugs target the same receptors in the brain, the timing of the pills and the patch worked in the quitter's favor. 
You might think the eyes determine what we see, but it's actually the brain. The mind uses 25% of its power on visual perception. Carter Evans shows us how a new app is helping one California college build a better baseball team through brain science. Batting practice seems like a no-brainer for David Andres. Nearly every time he swings, he connects. It's the same for teammate Joe Chavez, but both players struggled last season. I had a tough time picking out um, the different spins between fastball and changeup. Pitch recognition. Pitch recognition, yeah. Their improvement is visible, but it didn't come from practice on the field. It came from workouts in the school science lab. David and Joe were among 19 members of the baseball team at University of California, Riverside, taking part in an experiment. The goal, training the brain to see better. The players spent 25 minutes a day, four days a week, using a new app designed to expand brain power. These just look like blurry blobs. Yeah, and so these blurry blobs are called Gabor patterns. As we go through these screens, the wavy lines become closer and closer together. And so that's actually a measure of visual acuity. Neuroscientist Aaron Seitz is leading the study. Being able to see better is something that you kind of have to trick your brain into doing. So it's not making the eyes work any better. It's making the brain work better. Exactly. The brain registers only a fraction of what we see. Every image enters the retina upside down and is recorded by 125 million photoreceptor cells. That information is compressed down to fit within just one million fibers as it travels through the optic nerve. The eyes have this big image, but normally our brain doesn't process everything we see. Is that what you're saying? So that's actually true. Most of the visual field is very fuzzy and that we only have a sense of clarity is because we're moving our eyes about all the time. These are getting harder and harder to see. I mean, you're clicking on, I just don't even see what you're clicking on at this point anymore. After two months, the players boosted their vision by 30%. Able to see 90 mile an hour pitches in sharper focus, the team scored 42 more runs and five more wins in one season. Just picking up the different spin on the ball, you can lay off pitches that you normally swing at. If you can just recognize what, what's coming, oh, it makes the game so much easier. What a difference. Maybe this can make the Mets a little bit better. <laughs> Holly, are there other ways this app can be used, do you think? You know, Anthony, it's already being, being experimented with in other sports and also in law enforcement. You know, if you think mm, about sure. uh, officers who need to see license plates really quickly. But I think it's easy to see how it could be applied to any field where you need really, really good visual perception, whether you're a pilot or a surgeon. You know, I was thinking, John, it could help you in the colonoscopy lab. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I really seriously couldn't help thinking one of the huge problems for me as a gastroenterologist is finding these flat polyps that are really subtle and about 10 times more likely to have cancer. Maybe this could help train us to pick them up in a, in a better way. I lo love it. Finally this week, new research shows us the harmful effects of sitting on heart health. A study published by the Mayo Clinic suggests that two hours of sedentary behavior like sitting, watching TV, or driving can offset 20 minutes of exercise. This is sedentary, Anthony. We're here in this two-hour window right now, aren't we? You should stand up, I'll tell you. Exactly. We could turn this into a treadmill desk, and we can just all hold on. Let's and talk not to one say another. we did. And it, okay. it, this makes sense, right? Because in evolution, you know, people were not just sitting around. You sat yeah. around too long, you got eaten. True. But right. you have to keep moving, and now we're we're sitting around too much. <laughs> Dr. John LeCouc, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you both. Great to be here.